Hey, what's up guys? This is Nick with ModernZinc.com and today we're going to be coming at you with the first episode on our series of water cooling. Um, basically today I'm just going to go over the, the basic parts of the liquid cooling system and what they do. Um, in, the, in the next episodes we'll go into the installation process on the two different systems that we're going to be working on here. We're going to be doing an ITX system utilizing a bit Phoenix Prodigy um, and it's going to have a flexible tubing in it and then we're going to do a full ATX setup with the Fractal Define S and it's going to have a full rigid tubing setup. Um, first of all I'd like to give a, a big shout out and a big thank you to our sponsors um, Aqua Tuning, Alpha Cool, uh, Phobia, Bit Phoenix, Fractal. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for providing us with all the uh, awesome hardware that we're going to be using in our videos. Um, that, that being said, let's just get straight on into it. Um, there are basically five, actually six basic components to a liquid cooling system. First, you have your CPU block. Um, this is a, a kind of an old, really basic one. Um, basically, what the CPU block does is it collects the heat. It uses a copper plate that collects the heat from your processor. And then the copper plate usually has a set of rows or pins on it that the water uses to collect the heat and then it distributes that heat to the rest of the liquid cooling system. Now the top of the water block usually just has a couple of ports and some tie downs but this one I've already gone ahead and taken apart for you and this way you can see the little rows and the little uh, I guess teeth is the best way to describe them um, that the is used to transfer the heat from the copper base to the fluid that's running through your system. And then on the other side, here we have the, uh, there's, a there's always a rubber o-ring, this is what keeps the, the water from leaking out from the block. And then this little piece here is basically what is, it's called a pressure plate. And what that does is, is, is it separates the inlet from the outlet and it makes sure that there, there's only that very, very little gap between here and the back of the back plate for the water to run through, making it more efficient to pick up heat. And then from your CP, with our CPU block, we go to, usually it goes, it's gonna go to your radiator. Now, radiators come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There's there's some that are passive, they don't use fans at all, and then there are active radiators that do use fans. Um, as you can see in the back, we have some larger ones. This is a 360 millimeter radiator. We've got another 240 millimeter radiator, and then we have a 120 millimeter radiator. They do have different, di different thicknesses. These are 30 millimeter radiators. There's um, 45 millimeter radiators, 60 millimeter radiators. This one down here is what is referred to as the Monsta, and it is an 80 millimeter radiator. Um, basically, the thickness doesn't necessarily determine performance, but that being said, a thicker radiator does hold more fluid and the more fluid your system has in it, the more stable the temperatures are going to be. And the way a radiator works is it has usually a minimum of two ports. There can be as many as seven sometimes. But basically water is gonna, or fluid is gonna go in through one port and it has a, a set of rows here, channels that the, the water flows through. It comes down into this other portion, which is called a tank and then it transfers to the other portion of the radiator and then it comes out. And as it's running down these little bitty channels, all these little tiny fins is what actually um, takes the heat from the little, the, the tubes or the rows and it, and it gets distributed through the, to the rest of the system 
with through the fans, and then it gets exhausted out usually with another fan. Um, and it actually, if, if if I wish I could, I, I wish I could just cut this in half and show you the inside of a, of a radiator. Maybe I might do that in a later episode since I do have quite a few extra ones here. Um, and then from our radiator, it's generally going to go into a reservoir. And uh, the, once again, reservoirs come in, in many shapes and sizes. Um, there's the most popular being right now are tube reservoirs. And I guess the next after that would be the bay style reservoir, which is the kind that goes into the five and quarter inch front bay in the front. Um, the tube reservoir basically has two purposes. One, it stores fluid. That's what a reservoir does. Second, it is used to prime your pump. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But other than that, the reservoir really has no other purpose. It, it stores water and, like I said, it's used to prime your pump. Um, other than that, that's it. Um, and then from your reservoir, we usually have, it runs into your pump, and this is what makes the fluid flow throughout the entire system. Most pumps have an inlet and an outlet, and the way this one was set up to work is this particular piece goes directly into the reservoir, so we have an out from the reservoir directly going into your pump, which primes it and what and you hear me say prime a few times already but you're like what well, what's this prime thing you're talking about priming is these pumps don't work unless there's fluid in them and when you what, what i mean is it'll work i can plug it in and you'll hear it come on and go Ree! but if there's no fluid in the pump it's not going to move fluid throughout the rest of the system. The fluid in the, the also the fluid acts as a lubricant for the pump motor itself for the little impeller. And if there's no lubricant in there, it's going to overheat within a matter of seconds. So what we call priming our pump, what a priming means is is it mean that means getting water into the pump so that when you turn it on it already has water in it and all the rest of the water starts moving throughout the, the system. So if you have your outlet of your reservoir go to the inlet of your pump, you pour water into your reservoir and it primes the pump. So that way when you turn it on, the rest of the water goes throughout the system. Now, to connect all these glorious components, you need fittings. And there are several different kinds of fittings. They're in several different sizes. Make sure that your fittings all are all the same size because there's nothing more infuriating than getting the wrong size fittings. Um, let, I guess I should go ahead and go into the different kinds of fittings. Uh, the most basic of all fittings is what is called a barb fitting. And basically a bar, what a barb fitting does is you just take your tubing, you slip it over the end of the barb, and most people use a little metal ring collars or even a zip tie to hold this to hold the tubing in place. It, it does a good enough job. It's just not a very secure um, form of holding the tube. Uh, I wouldn't transport the computer around that was using a fitting fitting like this. And generally, when I was running fittings like these, I would before every time I turned my computer on, I would always make sure that all of the tubes were properly in place and there was no leaking. Moving on from your compression, from your barb fitting, the next step up is what's called a compression fitting. And a compression fitting is very similar to a barb, except it has this metal lock ring. And the way that works is you put your, your tubing on the little barb here, and then when you tighten down the lock ring, it compresses the tubing the side walls of the tube against the outside wall of the barb. And what that does is, is it makes a very, very, very secure hold. Once it's on there, it's not going to slip out. 
you have to release the tension from the tubing itself in order for it to slip out. And then, other than that, there are uh, a, missile, a bunch of missile, other miscellaneous fittings. There's angled fittings. Um, these come in 45 degrees, uh, 90 degrees. Every once in a while you'll see a 60 degrees or sometimes even a 30. Um, they also come in a swivel style, which is kind of like this. This is what's called a coupler and it's it's threaded at both ends but it it swivels so you can each end spins independently of the other and these are ideal for connecting reservoirs to pumps or even pumps to to radiators um, another fitting is the extension fitting uh, these come in any anything from five millimeters all the way up to 30 millimeters, which is this one. And, and all this is used for is to extend from your radiate, whatever you're mounting it to, to sometimes like if, for instance, you have a fan here, see how the fitting is, it'd be a little hard to get it on there. Whereas if I had the extension here, I could now use my angle fitting See what I'm saying? And then we have another coupler fitting. This is a non-swivel coupler. This just connects two pieces to each other. The only difference is it will only spin so far. Then we have your plug. These are probably the most um, underspoken but most important fittings because without these you get fluid ev just everywhere and then this is what is called a bulkhead fitting and basically what this is used to is it's used to transition between two pieces of metal or two pieces of uh, uh, plexiglass and it's usually used to transition between two separate areas of the uh, PC. So you, and it's, it, it usually, a lot of times it's used to hide some tubing, but, um, and the way it works is it has a, a, a ring, a lock ring, a lock nut that holds it in place. So you drill a hole, which should be about a 22 millimeter hole and then you, you t stick this through the hole in the, in the metal or the plexiglass that you're working and then you just secure it down with the lock nut on the back. And then you can take your other fittings and thread them in. And uh, last but not least is the fan. Now there are all kinds of fans on the market, but we use a particular type of fan for liquid cooling, and that's called a static pressure fan. And the and you're and, and now you're asking me what's the, what's a static pressure fan? What's the difference between static pressure and, and, and a regular fan? A regular fan or an airflow fan is when it's when the air comes out the back of the fan, it it kind of fans out and gets uh, kind of like a shotgun effect. It, it pushes air out in all directions, but it doesn't push air very far or very hard. Whereas a static pressure fan is designed to push air directly behind it. It doesn't, air doesn't go out this way, it doesn't go out this way, it goes out straight back and the air goes farther and it pushes harder. And the reason you want this is when you put it up against the radiator, if your fan doesn't push hard enough, the air, if, if you're not going to feel the air getting pushed past the radiator and it's not going to be as effective in cooling. Now there's two different orientations, well actually three. There's push where the fan pushes the air through the radiator and then there's pull 
where the fans pull the air through the radiator and then there's push and pull where you have one pushing through and one pulling. Um, honestly and truly, I, I've, I've done both push, both pull. It, it honestly, it, some people say push is better because the fan pushes the air better throughout the back. But you have to keep in mind that unless you have some sort of space between your fan and your radiator, the back of the fan hub here creates what's called a dead zone. And that's, that's a spot where there's no, there's no air being pushed through it. Whereas if you have it in a pull setup, <coughs> excuse me, where the air is pulling, being pulled through, there's no dead zone. All the air gets pulled in through the entire uh, radiator. And um, there's, there's all kinds of, of fans. Uh, the reason we went with these is because they've, uh, been, they've been used all, quite a bit in the water cooling industry. And another reason is uh, a lot of times when we uh, tighten them down off the radiators, some fans don't have this little plastic um, piece that connects the two flanges. And when you tighten it, what happens is it ends up bending the fan and sometimes it can crack, whereas this is a little bit more rigid and it won't bend. Uh, once again, uh, I would like, oh, there's, there's a seventh component. Oh, I almost, derp, derp, almost forgot. Uh, the, the seventh component is what all the fluid travels around in. And that is your tubing. We've got some Mayhem's crystal flex tubing here. Um, basically all the tubing does is that is what moves, that is what the water travels in from component to component to component. Now it's flex tubing, there's also rigid tubing. Um, lately you've seen a lot of people starting to use copper. Um, that's, you know, getting to be another little popular method. We're not going to be going into that, but we will be getting into into the copper. Um, well guys, that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, in the next episode, we'll be getting started with the uh, integration of the cooling system into our Bit Phoenix Prodigy. And we'll go over all the particular components we chose for that layout and why we used it, why we're using them. And then after that, we're going to go into the uh, rigid setup with the fractal define s and we're going to do the same thing with that we're going to you know go over our uh, layout of our components why we chose them and how we're laying them out uh, the series is probably going to last several weeks because i'm planning on doing uh, one video probably every two weeks because there is uh, a lot of a little bit of custom work that has to be done in between each one i'm not modifying the cases to fit the components i'm just modifying the appearance of the cases because i don't like working with stock cases so there you have it uh, once again um, a big shout out to our sponsors aqua tuning alpha cool phobia bit phoenix and fractal and we'll see you guys next month